So let's take a deep breath and just give yourself the gift of being present, okay? Relax, let go of any fear. Remember, you're not alone in this. And so for now, just have hope and focus on being here with me. I'm gonna squeeze a ton of information to the next hour. I highly suggest taking notes. In fact, we're gonna share a note-taking guide that I had specifically developed for this class. It should pop up in the comments. And if you can um, you know, take that and grab a pen and paper, studies show that you are seven times more likely to recall something when you use pen and paper to write it down. So maybe use the guide as a guide and then really write down notes with pen and paper. And it's so important to understand that this isn't intended to substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This is the disclaimer bit, but always seek the advice of your physician with any questions you have. I am not a doctor. So never disregard any professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard here today. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna make it so the chat all comes directly to me and my team. I love that so many people are on today. We have over 1,100 people register for this, but the chat is probably the most distracting part, as fun as it is, and I wanna make sure you get the most out of this. So you can still comment. We will get it. We will read everyone. We will respond to everyone. Ask all your questions. It will come directly to us. All right, so let's get started. It took me years of internal battles and heartache to admit to myself that I needed to change my drinking. I vividly remember waking up about 3 a.m. every single night, and as soon as I realized I was awake, my stomach would clench, I would bite my lip, and I would brace myself because I knew what was coming. I knew the bout of self-loathing that would leave me absolutely in pieces. And then I would lay there and I would try to count how much I drank the night before. And the memories would go fuzzy and after four, maybe five glasses of wine, I'd just lose count. And I was sick with my behavior because I had made myself these promises to stick to just two or three glasses, to stop drinking by 10 p.m., promise I was, I was never able to keep. I was awful to myself. I would yell at myself inside my head, what are you thinking? Why can't you be stronger? Why can't you be normal? Why don't you care about your family, about your kids? Why can't you just get this under control for them? Don't you care about anything, about getting cancer, even about dying? Why, why, why? And I thought that if I could just make myself see this horror of my behavior, how far that I had fallen, then somehow I would have the strength to regain control. And I was usually awake for an hour. Sometimes I would cry. Sometimes I was so disgusted that all I would feel is anger. And near the end, I would actually sneak into the kitchen for more alcohol, just enough to shut down my brain, fall back asleep, and stop hurting. And then the next morning, it was nuts. It was as if I had amnesia. I turned back into a generally happy person, never even thinking about the misery of just hours earlier. The truth was I couldn't reconcile my pain, so I just ignored it. And the most ironic part was that if you would have asked me about drinking, I would have told you that I loved it. I would have said it relaxes me, that I deserve a drink at the end of a day, that it made my life more fun, and I would have meant every single word. And that's because during the day I felt in control. I was incredibly successful in my career. I was a senior executive for a, the largest FX company in the world. I was busy. I was balancing career and family, and outward signs of how much I drank were practically non-existent. And I was so busy that I did not leave room for honesty. And then the evening would come, the drinking would start, and the cycle continued. And after just one glass, I was no longer in control. And the only time that I was brave enough to admit it, even to myself, was alone in the dark at three in the morning. That's because the implications were terrifying. I mean, <laughs> what if I have a problem? What if there's something wrong with me? What if I'm not normal? What if I'm an alcoholic and most terrifying? What if I can't successfully drink less? And what if I have to give up alcohol altogether? What I knew about getting help, I knew from my brother who had spent some time in prison. And prison in the US involves mandatory AA meetings. He told me that you start every meeting that, and by admitting you're an alcoholic, that you're powerless over alcohol. He said they believe alcoholism is a fatal illness without a cure. And I personally know people who are self-proclaimed alcoholics and they haven't found peace, but they fight for their sobriety. So to be honest, at that point in my life, it just seemed miserable to be sober in today's culture. I felt like that would be living a life avoiding temptation. I would have to learn to accept life as just okay and adjust to this new reality of missing out. In fact, the idea of regular meetings about alcohol for the rest of my life seemed like it would give alcohol even more power in my life than ever before. And I realize this is prideful and certainly not a mentality of surrender. And it's true, I'm incredibly strong-willed. In fact, I've worried that my pride would be my undoing because at the time, even when I was struggling, I had no intention of labeling myself or admitting I was powerless over a fermented liquid in a glass. The truth is, is that if my choice was to live a life of misery 
in diseased abstinence or drink myself into an early grave, I would have chosen the latter. This is horrifying, and even now it's hard for me to admit to you, but this was true for me. I needed to make alcohol small and irrelevant in my life rather than allowing it even more power over me. I had to find another way. And thankfully I have. I now have freedom, I'm back in control, I've regained my self-respect, I'm not locked in a battle for sobriety. In fact, I drink as much as I want whenever I want. And the truth is I just no longer want to drink. I don't live within these confines of rules and I never feel like I'm missing out. And I know today we're talking about moderation, but I want to share my truth. It's been years since I've drank and I've never been happier. I'm having more fun than ever. It's as if I've woken up from some weird version of the matrix. Like I took the red pill and then suddenly I realized that alcohol only dulled my senses and it kept me trapped rather than adding anything to my life. Now I know you're probably finding this hard, if not impossible to believe. And trust me, I can relate. I was so certain that alcohol was vital to relaxing and having a good time. I believed these things like I believe the sky was blue, but I didn't understand how the brain works. I didn't realize what was keeping me stuck in this endless cycle of fear and self-loathing and misery. So let me share my goals for today. First, I want to explore the six vital things you need to know about moderation according to science. These things are incredibly powerful, but not always easy to hear. In fact, many of these have created what's called cognitive dissonance or inner conflict inside of us when we hear them. This happens when you hear a fact and it doesn't sync with what you know or feel to be true. Then you get very uncomfortable. This information, if this information today makes you feel uncomfortable, please stick with me. Because in my second goal, I want to explain the one key trick to shifting the conversation entirely and finding freedom and control rather than any rules around our drinking. So you've probably tried to limit yourself to just one or two drinks. You may have tried this hundreds of times. Or you may have tried to limit yourself to a certain type of alcohol or make rules like no drinking until e the evening. And I'm here to tell you again that this is not your fault. What we don't realize is that setting limits on something we desire creates internal conflict, making it harder to achieve change. Most important is knowing that unsuccessful attempts in the past are not your fault and they're not a good indicator of your future success. So today, let's just clear the slate and start fresh. All right. So first I wanna tell you a bit about me and why should you listen to me anyway and exactly how I discovered the incredible methodology I call this naked mind. So my husband and my kids, that's my new baby in the middle, she's actually almost a year old now, which is nuts. And in the upper right, that's me when I was a little girl growing up in a tiny log cabin. Now here's a picture of it outside of Aspen, Colorado. It doesn't have running water or electricity. We had to snowmobile to get home in the winter because the roads closed. And if you can see that little building behind the cabin, that's an outhouse because there was no indoor bathroom. So despite my unusual upbringing, I found myself at the age of 26 living in New York City and one of the youngest vice presidents in the largest FX company in the world. Now, I didn't drink much at the time. And I remember one day my boss taking me aside and telling me that after work happy hour was a lot like the golf course. It was where you pitched your ideas, built relationships and where careers were made. I wasn't passionate about drinking, but I was passionate about my career. So I made it my mission to develop a tolerance. Sometimes when I was still a lightweight, I would sneak into the bathroom and throw up the last glass of wine in order to drink more wine. And my body learned how to keep up with my colleagues and soon drinking at work turned into drinking every night, work or home. And I was proud of my tolerance. I bragged about how I could keep up with anyone, everyone showing signs of being drunk. When I stopped drinking, people were surprised. They actually said, but why? I never even saw you drunk. But the truth was, it didn't matter how together my life was, or that I was never outwardly drunk in public, or that I never had a rock bottom experience, because I was stuck in this vicious cycle of self-loathing. This battle raged inside my mind. It was this war of making and breaking commitments and being very disappointed in myself. So we can fast forward a decade, I was now the global head of marketing, responsible for 28 countries, traveling internationally twice a month. This is a photo of me drinking, and that pissed off expression, it was on my face all the time. I hate this part about myself, and it's another thing that's hard to admit, but despite being a really sweet girl, at this stage in my career, I was known for making people cry at work. It was almost like I'd lost my sense of humanity and compassion. And then one day in London, I'd been out drinking late the night before with some colleagues. And I remember this particular morning so vividly. I had to wake up super early to get to Heathrow Airport and I felt awful. So I stopped at the hotel restaurant and was desperate to take the edge off my hangover. So I ordered a mimosa. 
And the waitress, she told me that it was so early they weren't yet opening the champagne, but I was desperate. And although I'd never drank hard alcohol in the morning, it was one of those little lines that I figured if I didn't cross this line, then things are still okay. This morning was particularly miserable. So I ordered a vodka and orange juice and I rationalized it by telling myself that the OJ made it a breakfast drink. But the reality was that I was drinking vodka at six in the morning and I drank a few before heading out to the taxi. I got off the Heathrow Express in this very tunnel, feeling awful. I felt shameful, physically rotten. I just felt worthless. I sat down on that bench and I was unable to avoid reality. Vodka at 6 a.m. was something I never thought I would do. And I was headed back home to the States, to my family, to my husband and my two small boys. And I knew I would be arriving home a shell of myself. It's bad enough to be jet lagged, but I compounded it with late boozy nights and no sleep. They deserve the best of me. And I was giving them the worst. I knew I had to change, but at this point, I just had no idea how. But I also knew that I had to be true to myself or I would never succeed, and none of my promises around drinking had ever worked. I didn't have the willpower to deprive myself. I didn't want to spend my life on an alcohol diet, and nor did I think I would actually be able to. And then I remembered something. I remembered it wasn't always this way. I remember that there was a time when I didn't need alcohol to relax or have a good time, and I wanted that back. I wanted to go back to the time when I didn't drink, and more importantly, I didn't miss drinking. Alcohol was making me miserable. My tolerance was so high, even after drinking almost two bottles of wine, I didn't feel the effects. There was no point to my drinking at all, yet for some reason, I was desperate for a drink at the end of the day, or at a party, or to relax, or basically in any situation. So there in this tunnel, it struck me. And then when the idea first came to me, I almost couldn't believe it. How could this be possible? Could it really be this easy? And if I was right, it would change everything. If I was right, I would be able to be free, truly, happily, and blissfully free. Now, I have to back up a bit and tell you about something else I've been dealing with at the time. I'd been suffering from excruciating back pain, and I tried everything, acupuncture, chiropractic, muscle relaxants, painkillers, stretching, exercise, even traction, and nothing had worked. I had spent thousands of dollars on medicine, specialists, and treatment, and I couldn't pick up my kids. It was heartbreaking. I had to take medicine just to sit on an airplane. One day, my dad, he was actually out skiing, and he was riding the lift with a stranger, and for some reason, they began discussing my back. And the stranger recommended this book called Healing Back Pain by Dr. John Sarno. He said when nothing else worked for him, that book changed his life. And just by reading the book, his back pain was healed. <laughs> so you're probably skeptical? Yeah. So was I. I was skeptical, but I was also desperate. So I read the book and sure enough, like it changed my life. I went from being unable to pick up my kids to jumping with them on the trampoline literally within a few days, just from reading a book. Hard to believe. I know, but it's true. And I have now been pain free for more than four years. Our minds are incredible. They're more powerful than any computer. They are the single least understood and single most complex thing in the known universe. And the reason reading a book healed my back was because my mind was actually trying to protect me. Now, I know this sounds bizarre, but let me explain. Dr. Sarno, methodology, he proved to me that the pain I felt was related to repressed or unconscious stress and anger. So how does this happen? You can imagine a young father and his screaming baby, and the father feels hopeless because nothing he does quiets this baby. So he's frustrated, he's even angry, and how can he not be? Because his baby, it's illogical, and the dad feels powerless. Yet this dad, he also believes he's generally a good person. He thinks he's the type of father who should not feel anger towards a helpless baby. And on some unconscious level, he believes it's actually unacceptable to feel furious with an infant. So what he feels becomes buried deep in his unconscious mind. In the part of mind that psychiatrist Carl Jung aptly named the shadow. Here's the thing. We unconsciously hide emotions that we feel are ugly or even just un incongruent with how we perceive ourselves. This is a classic defense mechanism. It's kind of like when I would buy the entire box of wine to protect myself from knowing how much of the bottle or more bottles than one I had drank. Your brain causes physical pain or other ailments to protect you through distraction. My pain was real. In fact, laboratory tests demonstrate that the pain is caused when your brain cuts off oxygen to the afflicted area. Yet it was easily cured. I just had to be convinced, both consciously and far more un importantly, unconsciously, that the pain was caused by my mind. And it took reading a 300 plus page book to convince my unconscious 
but I didn't actually have to address the repressed emotions. I just had to know the source and bring the unconscious emotions into my conscious awareness and the pain disappeared. How crazy is that? So can you believe how powerful our minds are? And can you start to see how important this might be? So in this tunnel, I realized that if the mind was powerful enough to create debilitating physical pain, then it was certainly powerful enough to keep me trapped in this awful drinking cycle. I realized in this one incredible moment that while I consciously, even desperately wanted to drink less, my far more powerful unconscious mind just had not received the memo. And this epiphany launched me on a journey of research. I wanted to validate the theory and free myself. I actually reached out to Dr. John Sarno and spoke with both authors and researchers in his field. I got in touch with a top neuroscientist in the field of addiction, Professor Thad Polk from the University of Michigan, and I invested thousands of dollars in continuing education, science courses, and studies relevant to my quest. And I knew that if I could bring my unconscious desires in line with my conscious desires, then I could end the internal battle and finally find freedom. And after about 12 months of research, never once putting limits on my drinking or trying to change through willpower, but rather dedicating my energy to a journey of empowerment through education, knowing that change would actually be easy, maybe even effortless, if I had su could successfully change my unconscious conditioning, it, it happened. Now, I'd read dozens of books and research papers, surveyed hundreds of drinkers, spent countless hours in class that focused on both the unconscious mind and the neuroscience of addiction, and I had methodically journaled documenting everything and developing a very specific method for how to easily change your unconscious conditioning around alcohol. Now, this is a photo of my office right in the middle of my research. One day in December, everything changed. It was like the fog lifted and I felt this overwhelming sense of appreciation. It was like the sun had peeked out from behind the clouds and everything was bright again. And I walked out of my office and I told my husband that if he ever wanted to get drunk with me again, tonight was the night because I was done drinking. And he was so surprised. He was literally speechless. After all, I'd been a huge alcohol advocate and a daily drinker for more than a decade of our marriage. But I had done it. I had found freedom and I didn't have any desire to drink and I certainly didn't miss it. It's incredible, right? And the most amazing part is I didn't feel any sense of sadness, just this euphoric sense of freedom. My entire mindset had changed. It wasn't that I could never drink again or didn't ever get to drink again. And I still, to this day, I refuse to put rules like that on myself. It was that I now knew that I never had to drink again. I never had to drink to have a good time or to relax because there was other more important things. I never had to feel hungover. I never had to feel guilty, regret, or bad about myself. I now knew through countless hours of research that everything I thought alcohol gave me was actually already inside. I had just lost touch with it. And life had again become so much fun. So over the next year, I pulled together all my journals into a method and a plan that anyone could follow happily, easily, and find freedom. And in October of 2015, The Snake in Mind was born. And although it was a completely independent endeavor without any media fanfare, the response from around the globe has been astounding. Now I'm going to get a drink of water. This Naked Mind, it's been featured in all sorts of media, Forbes, New York Post, Huffington Post, ABC, even abroad in the Daily Mail, the Irish Examiner, and so many more. In fact, Good Morning America, the biggest daytime television show in the US with 4.2 million viewers, came to my house with their entire camera crew to do a segment on my work. Why? Because it really, truly does work. And I get letters every single day from people all over the world who have changed everything with the program. They're happy again, in control, and they love who they are. The best letters I receive are the ones where children have noticed. And now not only have relationships been mended, but teenage children are looking at alcohol in a more cautious and mindful way, which is amazing. I hopped on Facebook to grab some stories because so many come in every single day. Things like life changing, amazing. I can't believe I'm actually happy about this change in my life. So, so a change that I was once dreading. I feel light and free and so many more. So you can see this incredible impact. But let's keep us on track and dive right into the six vital things you need to know about moderation. This information, it's invaluable. Here's why. I floundered for years in moderation limbo, actively trying to drink less and finding myself drinking more. All this self-loathing, I felt all the disgust, it came after I started to try to control my drinking. Before I wanted to make a change, I really didn't think about it. No, it was after I tried to control it and I couldn't easily control it that the real misery began. 
Let's talk about why that is. We've talked a bit about cognitive dissonance or internal conflict. And as human beings, we're averse to conflict. Just witnessing it gets us a stomach ache. If we fight with our family, it's awful. But the worst kind of conflict, it's with yourself, but it's something we don't always talk about. And the feeling of both wanting to do more and less of something at the same time, it's incredibly painful. It's stressful and it can quickly take over your entire life making you miserable. And the irony here is that this pain comes from trying to moderate. We didn't feel this inner conflict before we started to put limits on our drinking. We just drank what we wanted when we wanted. And sure we had hangovers and probably not as much energy as we could have had, and we certainly had regret of things we didn't said, but we didn't have the pain of wanting to change and not being able to. The pain of wanting something like a drink and hating a different aspect of that same something, like how much a hold of us alcohol has. And guess what we as drinkers do to relieve stress? Of course, you guessed it, we drink. So you can start to see this crazy cycle that we're caught in when we try to start moderating and we find it hard, sometimes impossible. So I think we have to start at the beginning and we have to start by asking the question, why do we wanna moderate? What exactly are we looking for? I believe there's two main reasons. First, we believe that alcohol makes us feel a certain way, relaxed, it's an escape. We feel more engaged, happier. We think we have more fun, we're funnier and so much more. And again, we believe these things like we believe the sun will rise because we don't just believe them with our minds, but we feel that they're true. And when you feel something is true, there's no amount of logic that can overcome that. We drink because we think it provides benefits. We see logically that alcohol is starting to have a price and in some cases a really hefty price. Our health, our happiness, our self-respect, in extreme cases, our jobs, our marriages, our families. So logically we know we should drink less. Why don't we think about stopping when we start to count the cost of regular drinking, it goes right back to our beliefs because we feel like alcohol provides a benefit. We may feel that it's the only way to relax after a long day at work or the only way to connect intimately with our partners. We might think that things are only fun when we're drinking. I can relate to this one. I remember the nights when I was the designated driver. I was generally miserable. Writing off the night is boring because I couldn't drink. So we don't wanna get rid of alcohol together, but we just want to somehow find this perfect balance where we still get the benefits, yet the cost goes way down. And the kicker is that we remember a time when there was little to no cost to our drinking. We remember a time when we could stop when we wanted and we didn't have these effects that we're now seeing in our lives. And since society paints a black and white picture of these two types of drinkers, people who are in control of their drinking and then those bad, irresponsible, immoral people who can't control it, we believe that there's something wrong with us if we feel we're crossing that invisible and ill-defined, by the way, line from in control of our drinking to out of control. We feel ashamed and frustrated, and that, of course, adds to the inner pain. And again, guess what we do when we're in inner pain and we're stressed? We turn to our friend in the bottle to numb that pain away. I wanna ask you today, what if we're asking the wrong questions? What if the whole idea that human beings should be able to drink an addictive substance in moderation while maintaining their health without getting addicted is a total farce? And what if this farce was perpetuated by the very industry that richly profits from alcohol? And what if the claims we now believe to be true, that alcohol relaxes us, that it makes life fun, that it's key to social life and we need it to fit in, what if these claims are not true? I know that it's hard to believe, but let's suspend belief for a minute. And I know you're skeptical because your beliefs feel incredibly real. You might want to argue with me and say, okay, I'm going to be able to get a drink after this and it's going to make me feel better. But hear me out. Yes, of course, it will make you feel better. But I can tell you that there are some very specific chemical reasons why. Reasons that we're going to cover today. And what if I told you that it will make you feel better, but it will never make you feel as good as you used to before you drink it regularly? Now, if I was a drinker still and I was listening to this class, I might be tempted to leave thinking, okay, this is just BS. There's no way you can convince me of everything you just said. I know different because my experience every day tells me different. And hey, I trust my own experience. Do me a favor, okay? Even if you think I'm crazy, stick with me because my job is to show you during this class how these things might be true. Obviously, I can't change your entire worldview within an hour, but I can open up enough of a question that you would be willing to say by the end of this class, okay, you might be right. So let's suspend belief, and for now, let's say that I am right, that alcohol actually provides no benefit. It just methodically steals your health and happiness. If that was true, 
would you want to moderate? Now, I'm not going to try and tell you that moderation is wrong or that nobody can successfully do it. Neither of these things are true. In fact, I believe if you want to moderate, this naked mind is probably the best path to successfully moderating. And why do I say that? Because of the many of hundreds of people who have gone through my programs, a lot of them are able to drink on occasion. In fact, let's hear from someone who's gone through this naked mind. She says, so after 132 days, I decided to try a glass of wine, my favorite Sauvignon Blanc. I didn't enjoy it and I only drank half the small amount that I poured. This is incredible for me as I used to drink two to three bottles every night. I feel so proud of myself and so much better. I will tell you, however, that thousands of people, people wanting to moderate, have gone through my programs and had this experience. They now feel they could drink moderately, but they no longer have the desire to drink moderately because their feelings, their beliefs, and their logic have changed. So let's hear from someone on that side. Kate says, it was unfathomable to consider moderating my alcohol intake. It had been a daily habit for the last 28 years. Unfathomable, that is, until Annie Grace. And in one week, I went from entrenched regular drinker to fully and happily alcohol-free, bypassing the moderation route entirely. I'm so grateful to Annie Grace for her frank, compelling, scientifically sound expose on the insidious nature of alcohol. If you're considering freeing the hold that alcohol has over you, this naked mind is inspiring and groundbreaking. I am forever inspired and changed. But let's come back to the second reason we want to moderate. So not only do we think that alcohol provides benefits, but we also think that living without it would be miserable. I have a friend who's sober seven years with AA, and about a year ago, we went on a trip with a bunch of families. Another friend of ours poured a whiskey, and my sober friend picked up the glass, sniffed it longingly, and then with a sad look in her eye, she put it back on the counter. And I was shocked. I couldn't make sense of the fact that after seven years, she was longing for a drink. Now, if that's what being sober looks like, no wonder we're desperate not to be sober. It looks like a lot of work. It looks like changing our entire social network, living a life of feeling on the outside of the action and feeling deprived and missing out. Frankly, yuck. So we want to moderate for these two reasons. We believe emotionally that alcohol provides a benefit or many. And in fact, almost everything we do, by the way, is to feel a certain way. And this is no different. And second, we think sobriety looks pretty miserable. So with that background, we're going to dive into the six reasons. And this is why this information is so important. It's because the first step to anything is awareness. We need to understand what we're up again. So what the truth about moderation is neurologically, physiologically, and psychologically. And that information, again, it's not always fun. In fact, it can be quite startling. But do me a favor and, again, stick with me even if you feel a bit uncomfortable because all change happens on the other side of knowledge and awareness. And you're most likely on this webinar because what you're doing now isn't quite working. Either you're not successful or you are successfully moderating, but it's making you miserable. In fact, let's look at this one different way. What if we lived in a, the future and as a society, we didn't drink alcohol and it was discovered, but at the same time, we discovered everything we now knew about alcohol. We discovered that it's found in the autopsies of the majority of suicide victims, that it kills twice the amount of people as all prescription illegal drugs combined, that more than 75% of child deaths from abuse involve alcohol, that it causes cancer, and in fact, just two drinks a week increases a woman's chance of breast cancer by 15%, and that death from alcohol steals more than 2.4 million hours of human life every year in the U.S. alone. So we learn all of this, and all of these things are true, by the way, and then we also learn that it will give you a rush and slow down your brain and give you a numbing sense and a feeling of relaxation. We learn everything you learn today, including how I'm going to explain to you that that feeling goes away in 20 to 30 minutes. <clears throat> Here's the question. If we discovered alcohol today with that knowledge, would we drink it? Would we allow it to be advertised, packaged, and sold for profit? Would we let our kids anywhere near it? So you might be thinking again, okay, you, you're going down the gloom and doom path. <laughs> but the truth is we need to be educated and aware, and we need to look at this stuff in order to find the way out. And the way out, I'm going to share it with you today. And one more thing, with all of my work, I see my job as just presenting facts in a clear and logical way, a way that you can understand. It's not to tell you what to do or to judge what you decide to do. I have so many participants who go happily alcohol-free without ever feeling like they're missing out, but also so many who go on to examine their beliefs and feelings and go on to drink on occasion. Now, after we go through the next six things, I want to explain in detail the difference between those two outcomes, the drinking on occasion or going totally alcohol-free, and why exactly some people choose one or the other, and what method they use to be successful with whatever their choice is. So first thing, 
Moderation means you are always making decisions. Now, have you ever felt like you just can't make one more decision? This happens to me sometimes when my husband asks what's for dinner, and it seems like such a simple question. After all, we eat dinner every single night. But the truth is that sometimes my brain just can't handle that question. Studies show that a decision, no matter how big or small, it takes the same amount of brain power. And that's very interesting. It means a decision about what to do for the weekend taxes your brain about the same amount as the decision to what to wear in the morning. And there's a scientific term for that. It's called decision fatigue, which basically means that decisions create mental fatigue and they deplete willpower. And according to the newest science on willpower, it's a finite resource, meaning that it, much like a muscle, can be exhausted. As you make decisions, your brain depletes its limited amount of mental stamina and it starts to use one of two shortcuts. You either make a rash decision and just do something without thinking it through, generally super impulsive, you just say, F it, I'm gonna take that drink that's offered to me, or you avoid deciding altogether. John Tierney from the New York Times, he says, the phenomenon of decision fatigue helps explain why ordinary sensible people get angry at colleagues and families, splurge on clothes, buy junk food at the supermarket, and can't resist the dealer's offer to rust proof their car. And by definition, moderation is constant decision making. How many, what to drink, when, how much is too much, should I have this next drink or not? And these decisions add up and fatigue your mental faculties which in turn makes you grumpy and exhausted. And guess what? If moderation was hard when you were in a good mood, it becomes next to impossible when your brain is tired and cranky from the effort. Making a single decision around your drinking, especially a strong decision for a period of time, like a 30-day break, it actually liberates you from the exhaustion of thousands of smaller daily decisions of moderation. This also frees you up to really reflect on the alcohol-free period and start to observe it and enjoy it instead of feeling like you're missing out. For me, the single decision meant freedom from the exhaustion of constantly trying to moderate. So number two, the well-known but overlooked reason moderation fails is tolerance. I worked really hard for my tolerance. Again, I thought it was a badge of honor. And I remember at the end of my drinking days, I could drink more than a bottle of wine without feeling it. I remember I would brag, we would brag all of us in the office about our tolerance. We prided ourselves on being the one who could stay out the latest, drink the most, wake up the earliest the next day. And this is literally insane considering what I now know about tolerance. I have a really good friend, she's a preschool teacher. And as soon as my children went to preschool for the first time, they were sick pretty much every other week for an entire year. And I remember asking her, how is it that as a preschool teacher, she's never sick when there's so many germs? She told me it was because she'd become immune to all of the most common germs because she's constantly exposed to them. Her body had become incredibly efficient at fighting off illness. The body realized it had no choice but to be exposed to all these germs, so it did everything it could to build an incredible immunity. Let's look at this in terms of tolerance. First, I wanna to just define tolerance. It's generally defined as the ability or willingness to tolerate something, in particular, the existence of opinions or behavior that one does not necessarily agree with. And the definition of tolerance when it comes to our body or the medical definition is the power of enduring or resisting the action of a drug or poison. So although we don't think about it, tolerance is our body's way of purging alcohol from our body as quickly as possible so that it does minimal damage. And when we're continuously exposed to poison, our bodies get more and more proficient in purging that poison. Tolerance is an immunity in the body. And the more tolerant we become, the less we actually feel the alcohol we drink. In this regard, the body has a singular focus to keep us alive. It does this in part by maintaining homeostasis or balance inside the body. And drinking alcohol throws the body off balance, so the body does everything it can to regain balance. Now, we'll go into this a bit more in a few minutes, but just know that as we drink more over time, we feel it less, of course, tolerance. And this is what causes us to increase the amount we drink. We chase that initial high. By the end of my drinking days, I barely ever felt drunk or tipsy. And this is a horrible flaw of moderation. Eventually, the two glasses you're sticking to won't have any impact whatsoever. So what is the point? And remember that tolerance is actually your body and your mind protecting itself by negating the effects of alcohol. Alcohol, by its very nature, causes you to need to, more of it to feel the same level of intoxication, which is, again, completely at odds with moderation. And this makes moderation very difficult on a chemical level. So reason number three. Alcohol affects your brain's ability to make good decisions. I would make myself a simple and seemingly easy to achieve rule of two glasses of wine per night. 
But the next morning, there was the heartache of not being able to recall how much I drank, but knowing it was far too much and being absolutely miserable. I hated my inability to just stick to those two glasses. I was convinced I had no self-control, that I was weak and stupid. But the truth is that even a single drink changes your state of mind. So that next drink doesn't sound like such a bad idea. This is because even a single drink impairs your decision-making abilities by harming your prefrontal cortex. This is a part of your brain that weighs consequences and makes decisions. The prefrontal cortex regulates the more primal animal parts of your brain and allows you self-control. And drinking takes this ability away. Drinking deadens your brain's reasoning power and steals it, its ability to make sensible decisions. And the terrifying irony here is that the very thing that you're moderating actually steals your ability to moderate. Now, alcohol in this class, both do the next one. <laughs> alcohol makes you thirsty. And this is an obvious but overlooked flaw in moderation. And it's a subject we gloss over when questioning is moderation possible. Alcohol is a diuretic. That means it makes you pee. This means that your body is more dehydrated after you drink an alcoholic drink than before. And studies show that alcohol is powerful enough diuretic to pull the moisture out of your very cells. It dehydrates you on a cellular level. And your cells not having enough water is a very, very bad thing. And even scarier dehydration also happens in your brain. One night of heavy drinking can cause your brain to shrink in volume because of dehydration. And so the side effect of being thirstier after a drink than before, and you can see here, a beer is made up of 95% water and 5% alcohol, but that 5% alcohol is strong enough to pull the 95% water out of your body plus more. So you're dehydrated after drinking something that's 95% water. But you don't realize that the alcohol is making you thirsty and another drink is even more tempting. It doesn't matter that you logically know another drink won't quench your thirst. We logically know that alcohol dehydrates you. It seems like it will subconsciously. So the drink in your hand just increases your craving for the next drink. So number five, and this one is really important. Alcohol creates a thirst for itself by numbing your pleasure response. Now this is true for any addictive substance. Substances are addictive because they stimulate artificially the pleasure circuit of your brain. As soon as the substance begins to leave your system, your mood plunges further than it was before you started. I'm going to explain exactly why this is, but first you might be thinking, oh great, a way to stimulate the pleasure center of my brain at higher levels than anything else can. And it might sound good on the surface, but here's why it's really so terrifying. When the brain's pleasure center is repeatedly artificially overstimulated by alcohol, it produces a counter chemical called dynorphin, which turns down the stimulation. Very simply put, this means that over time, because dynorphin is being constantly released, you no longer enjoy drinking like you once did. And further, the dynorphin doesn't discriminate and decreases all types of pleasure in your brain. This means that everyday activities that used to bring you pleasure are no longer felt because of the constant presence of dynorphin in the brain. This is the reason that you come to believe alcohol is the only thing that can make you happy. And eventually this becomes true. And with enough drinking, even alcohol can't pull you out of the alcohol induced funk that you're in. According to neuroscientist, Dr. Thad A. Polk, the drinker's body becomes used to the presence of alcohol in such a way that eventually the drinker will need alcohol just to feel normal. And at some point, no matter how much you drink, you'll be unable to feel anything but misery. Yet because your brain's conditioned response to the drug, you will crave alcohol constantly. This means you'll feel desperately like you want something you no longer even enjoy, which is terrifying. Now there's another aspect to this. You might be familiar with the fact that alcohol is a depressant, but the truth is it's also a stimulant. So how can the same substance be a stimulant and a depressant? This is one of the key factors in why moderation is extremely difficult. So let me explain. You've probably heard of BAC, or blood alcohol contact, content in the context of driving drunk. This is a picture of a breathalyzer. I used to actually carry one around with me to make sure I was under the legal limit before getting my car. I took drinking very seriously. When you take a drink, the level of alcohol in your blood or your BAC starts to rise. Rising BAC is associated with the energetic euphoric feeling that a drink creates. And for one drink, your BAC will rise for 20 to 30 minutes, possibly 60 minutes on a full stomach. Now, this change in how we feel due to our BAC rising is one of the main reasons we drink. 
what we don't realize is that after just 20 to 30 minutes, our BAC begins to fall as alcohol is purged from our body. And as we learned before, your body gets more and more efficient at purging alcohol. Again, this is tolerance. And a falling BAC creates all sorts of unpleasant emotions, including tiredness, uneasiness, restlessness, sadness, depression, anxiety. In fact, the following BAC is correlated with the release of cortisol or a stress hormone in your body. So what happens after a half an hour when your BAC starts to fall is now you're feeling worse than you did before you had that drink in the first place. And so what do you do? You reach for another drink and you do this to keep your BAC rising. And you can continue to do this for most of the night. When you keep your BAC rising, you continue to experience the pleasant emotions until your BAC reaches 0 0.06 and higher. And at that level of blood alcohol content, the emotions reported are wholly unpleasant. This, is, this explains why we get angry and weepy drunks. This is because you can't keep your BAC rising indefinitely. At some point of intoxication, your body does everything possible to stop your BAC from rising to more dangerous levels. Now here's the kicker. Remember how I said for one drink, your BAC will rise for 20 to 30 minutes? Well, that same drink will cause your BAC to fall for two to three hours. You're trading minutes of enjoyment for hours of misery. Now, why don't we know this? Because we'll often continue to drink for the entire night and then our BAC falls when we're asleep overnight. And sure, we wake up the next morning and we don't feel great, but we don't associate that with drinking from the night before. So how does this relate to moderation? Unless you continue to drink and keep your BAC rising, your BAC will start falling which results in you feeling miserable and craving a drink even more than before you had your first. And on a subconscious level, you know that another drink will relieve the feelings of your BAC falling that that first drink created. The, in short, the effect of one drink is to create a physical and psychological desire for another drink. I remember just starting to think about my next drink and feeling upset if I wasn't gonna allow myself to have one well before the drink in my hand was empty. Number six. Alcohol changes your brain to where you want it, but no longer like it. So alcohol increases cravings by releasing dopamine and addictive drugs from nicotine to heroin release artificially high levels of dopamine in the brain. Scientists now know that dopamine is linked to learning and learning includes feelings of wanting, expecting, and craving. In addition to giving us some pleasure, dopamine teaches us how to get pleasure. It helps us learn the most effective ways to stimulate the brain's pleasure center. Dr. Sayer Gottfried says, quote, the one of the key functions of the neurotransmitter dopamine is to create feelings of pleasure that our brains associate with necessary physiological actions like eating and procreating. We are driven to perform these vital functions because our brains are conditioned to expect the dopamine rush that accompanies them. Addictive drugs flood the brain with dopamine and condition us to expect artificially high levels of the neurotransmitter. Over time, the brain requires more and more dopamine than it can naturally produce, and it becomes dependent on the drug, which never satisfies the need it has created. And the plot thickens, because although at your first liking of the at first your liking of the substance was in sync with your wanting of alcohol, over time the brain responds in a way where the wanting and liking become decoupled. In fact, some experts say that this moment is when addiction begins. That might not make sense. How can you want something you don't even like? <laughs> I remember this so vividly in my own life. I had strong cravings for alcohol, even when I knew it would make me miserable, when my tolerance was so high and I didn't even feel the effects. When it was clear that alcohol was damaging my life, I craved desperately, I wanted alcohol, even when I no longer liked or enjoyed it. If you stay away from alcohol, this thankfully goes away, but moderating perpetuates these cravings. This is because your brain has, through years of regular drinking, been conditioned to react to alcohol in a certain way. Now, according to a study by Terry Robertson and Kent Barrage, one drink, no matter how long you've been sober, can trigger a dopamine response and your cravings can come back in full force. This explains why one drink, even after prolonged abstinence, can stimulate cravings for alcohol so that you continue to drink no matter the consequences, and worse, you don't even enjoy it. Enjoy it. The misery here comes from desperately wanting and craving something you no longer even like. And this is one of the primary reasons that moderation is miserable. It makes me crave something that I'm not even sure I want. And depending on what alcohol has done to the chemistry in 
my brain, these cravings may come back in full force even after a break. So although I'm convinced that moderation takes far too much effort, I have to say that it was extremely helpful in one sense. By attempting to moderate before this naked mind, I was faced with the misery of moderating. It was in fact this slippery slope of moderation that set me on the journey that I talked about at the beginning, a journey through the science, the psychology, to understand alcohol. And it was this journey that was truly launched by my attempts to, at moderation that allowed me to find peace. Now, do you remember this slide? We talked about two types of drinkers and we felt that there was something wrong with us because for some reason we weren't responsible enough or we lacked willpower to stay in control. Can you now see <laughs> the science proves that it's not your fault, not even a little bit, that moderation on a neurological, physiological, psychological level just does not make sense? Let me say it again. If you've tried to drink less and been unable to, it is not your fault. You are a human being with blood and flesh and bones and brains, and that's human, how human organisms react to how, alcohol, period. And by the way, numerous studies have been done on lab animals, things like having them develop a tolerance or alcohol creating a thirst for itself inside their bodies or turning on an immunity to a poison. These things are not exclusive to humans. So now I'm sure you're saying, okay, Annie, I can see why the cards are stacked against successful moderation. But you said that you see people go back to drinking at moderate levels all the time where alcohol is no longer a problem. Okay, let's get into that. That's so important. But first I wanna address another question you might have. You're probably wondering, what about all the people you know who can just take it or leave it that don't seem affected? Now this is a great question and there are reasons just as solid as the reasons I presented in today's web class but I don't have time today to get into it. But the one thing I will say is that no matter who you are or how in control you think you are, if you drink regularly, tolerance only goes one way. This is a physiological fact. The body reacts to alcohol the only way it knows how, by creating processes to minimize the effect and purge it from the body as quickly as possible. This is true for all humans. There's so much more to this, like where people are on the spectrum, their level of consumption, the length of time, their mentality around alcohol, their different physiological reactions to alcohol. But again, that's an entirely new topic. So today, we're going to focus on drinkers who have decided they want to moderate and why with my approach, some people go on to drink on occasion while others don't. So first, let's take a look at a few more people and see if we can find the pattern. The key is really obvious when you see it, and I truly believe that it's the key to successful moderation, but it actually took me some time to see it. So I pulled these from the last few days. So the first one, last night we went out to the casino and then to see a band, and I decided to experiment, my choice. I ordered one beer, it tasted nice, but it didn't do much. I ordered another, I drank it, and then I stopped. So I had two drinks. However, I don't think it enhanced my night in any way. She goes on to say, I ended up meeting the singer and having a photo taken. I think if I was drunk, I would have said something stupid and looked like shit in the photo, but I didn't. Turns out the singer's on day 10 and she's tried four times and kept getting to day nine and giving in. So I wanna make two points here. First, the woman who's been through this naked mind drank but didn't feel it enhanced everything and stopped. The singer had four times to get to day 10. Why? My best guess after watching thousands of people go through this process is that the singer is still using willpower and willpower runs out. And when do you need willpower? When you either have a conscious or unconscious desire for alcohol. And in her case, I bet the desire is unconscious because she's consciously trying to go alcohol free. So here's another example. Day 34 and I've been playing around with social drinking. I feel ambivalent. Three times this week I had one drink at social functions and I did not desire to drink anymore. Maybe you're starting to see a pattern. But first, let's hear from the people who are in the other group, the other outcome two of this naked mind. I got this one a few days ago. She says, Annie, I wanna personally thank you. I'm approaching one year sober in nine days, not a single relapse. I can drink if I want, I just choose not to. How cool is that? And you remember, that's exactly how I feel in my life. I don't even call myself sober. I feel like I could drink, but I just no longer want to. And that is one of the best feelings in the world. Now this one's harder to read and it's long, but I'll summarize. She says, 94 days AF, that's alcohol free. Woohoo, yay me, I wanna thank Annie Grace for where I am today. Originally, I had no intention of becoming AF. With this naked mind, I've learned to really despise this liquid and never let it touch my lips again. That's my story in a nutshell. Now, while there are exceptions, I want to tell you something that I believe to be true for most people. 
when someone has made the decision to actively try and moderate their drinking, they're generally at a stage with drinking where alcohol has its hooks in them, both physically and even more importantly, psychologically. I see this all the time and with myself included. We're not physically dependent, but we're psychologically addicted. This means our thinking has changed and our neural pathways around habitual drinking have been reinforced to the stage that if we decide not to drink, we're miserable and deprived because we believe so firmly that alcohol provides a benefit. Yet we don't see this. So when alcohol is causing a problem, we do the logical thing and decide we're gonna cut back and try to moderate. What we don't realize is that depriving ourselves from the very thing we rely on creates that huge amount of inner conflict and stress. You'll remember how we went over this in detail in the beginning. So if you're actively trying to moderate, chances are that moderation might not come easy without the right tools. So let's talk about what exactly this means. It means that freedom is changing the entire conversation, moving from a mindset that says, how can I moderate to one that says, why would I want to moderate? That's where true freedom is. And the irony is that when you change your mindset and take a break from alcohol to arrest these patterns that occur inside the brain and body, that's the point where you might actually be able to moderate. Here's why you move from a desperation or addiction disguised as attempted moderation to a true take it or leave it mentality. And that take it or leave it mentality, I didn't even want it, that is what you see in those screenshots that we just shared from people in outcome one. So to put it really plainly, the best way to moderate once you've reached the point in your relationship where you want to moderate is to undo your unconscious conditioning around alcohol so that you no longer desire alcohol. Again, the irony is that your best chance, the best chance you have in moderation is to be in a place where moderation is no longer a key goal or that important in your life. And this is true over and over and over again. I could tell you dozens of stories of people who only drink on occasion, including the incredible artist who drew this cover art for my book, but they do so because by undoing the lifetime of unconscious conditioning, alcohol has actually lost its power over them. And they go on to drink on occasion happily for years and years. So perhaps you'd like to hear the keys of exactly how that happens. First, go through and change every single belief you have around alcohol. It, with my work, you'll never be asked to believe something you don't come to believe on your own. Again, my job is just to present the facts and allow you to draw your own conclusions. Through this naked mind, we uncover every belief around alcohol from relaxation to escape, to better sleeping, to dating, to better sex, to just getting tipsy, to enjoying the taste. And we do it through science. The program speaks both to your conscious and your unconscious mind, freeing you from the belief, not only logically, but emotionally. So you don't feel like you want to drink. And when that happens, you don't feel like you want to moderate. Next, we eliminate anxiety by going through an alcohol-free period together without expectations. And this is key. Most often people take a break from alcohol, they do it all the time, but they miss it and they actually expect to be miserable. I remember every time I was pregnant or I was a dry, designated driver, I unconsciously decided that life without alcohol was not gonna be all that much fun and so it wasn't all that much fun. When we have the expectation of something being miserable, it becomes miserable. But once you change your beliefs, you can experiment with an alcohol-free period without the longing or desire for alcohol because there's a really big difference between being miserable because life with alcohol is truly miserable and being miserable without alcohol because alcohol has changed your brain. Now, as we've discussed today, to make, uh, change your brain like we've discussed today, to make life without alcohol miserable. And when you undo these beliefs, you can go into situations you used to drink in like a detective. You won't be expecting to have a miserable time. And when that happens, chances are, and you are often so pleasantly surprised by how much fun you do have. And I've seen this to be true over and over again. So this is awesome. We've accomplished our goals for today. We went over the six vital things to know about moderation. And we went over the one key trick to shifting the entire conversation. And that trick is the unconscious mind and then doing your unconscious beliefs around alcohol. And if you go on a journey to change the unconscious mind, not only do I believe that your desire to moderate might evaporate, but I also know it's your best chance at moderation.